Hello, welcome to the Tim Booker channel. I wish you an enjoyable listening experience. Today, I want to talk to you about the book titled, Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. It tells us that to become an excellent leader, you need to make changes in three aspects from the outside in. The most remarkable phrase in this statement is probably, from the outside in. It seems to go against our usual understanding. Typically, when we discuss a person's progress or change, we say that a person needs to engage in reflection and introspection, discover their shortcomings in a certain aspect, and then make a determined effort to change. This logic is from the inside out. At first, it may sound reasonable, but it has a fatal flaw. This is because the answers from reflection are usually based on your past experiences, while you need to address current or even future issues. How can you ensure that the answers from reflection can solve real-world problems? So, using reflection as the starting point for change seems somewhat self-limiting. So, what should the approach to leadership be? Let me introduce you to an interesting story model called the Hero's Journey. Initially, heroes live in an ordinary world, leading lives that are not much different from those of regular people. But a chance event occurs, almost like a call from a mission. Despite psychological resistance, they ultimately choose to leave their homes and venture into an unknown, risky external world. In this external world, they will encounter mentors and companions, as well as tests and adversaries. After a series of trials, they eventually obtain the treasure, and the questions that once confused them are answered. The hero's life enters a new phase. After hearing this, do you feel a strange sense of familiarity? That's right, because for thousands of years, myths from around the world follow this same pattern, and even Hollywood movies often reference this framework extensively. Works like, Journey to the West, Avatar, and, Kung Fu Panda, are no exception. Why is that? Because it aligns with the long-standing observations of human civilization. Many extraordinary individuals throughout history have indeed followed such a path. So, what does this model have to do with our topic today? An ordinary person who wants to rise to a heroic level does so through experiences in the external world. If you want to become an excellent leader, you must also go through your own hero's journey. Leadership is not developed through internal reflection at home or in the office but through new experiences in which you seek to improve your leadership. In other words, it's a process from the outside in. This philosophy of leadership from the outside in is the most important theoretical foundation of the book, Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader. The author of this book is Herminia Ibarra from the United States. As a woman, she has been a professor at Harvard Business School and INSET, and she was selected by Harvard Business Review as one of the 50 most important management thinkers of the 21st century. The core viewpoint of the book is the principle of starting by acting like a leader. In this process, your behavior and thought patterns change, ultimately leading to an improvement in your leadership skills. It's like the quote from Aristotle, a man is what he repeatedly does. Excellence, then, is not an act but a habit. Similarly, you must first behave like a leader before you can truly become one. In this process, you need to achieve three transformations in three areas. Today, I'll present my interpretation of this book according to these three aspects, dividing it into three sections. The first part is about breaking out of the competency trap and redefining your job content. The second part is about breaking out of the relationship trap and redefining your interpersonal network. The third part is about breaking out of the authenticity trap and redefining your inner self. You can think of these three traps as the challenges in this hero's journey, and the three redefinitions as the continuous transformations you undergo during this journey, okay, let's start with the first part. The first challenge you need to face is the competency trap. So, what is the competency trap? It means that people tend to get stuck doing what they are best at. Doing what we excel at gives us a sense of achievement, and it's likely what led to our past success. However, this can cause us to overlook other more critical aspects. In the book, there's a case about a person named Jacob, who was the deputy factory manager responsible for production at a European food company. The company had received substantial investment and was expanding its production capacity. Jacob's title remained the same, so he continued with his usual management style. He worked on the production line every day, dealing with conflicts that arose during the production process. He believed that his meticulous management style was the reason for his past success. So, what happened? At the end of the year, everyone had complaints about him. 
His subordinates wanted him to give them more space to work, and the boss wanted him to enhance collaboration with other departments and expedite the production line's renovation plan. Jacob is a typical example of falling into the competency trap. He failed to realize that the approach he had excelled at in the past was no longer effective after the factory expanded. So, the skills that got you to your current position may not be able to take you to the next one. Past success experiences can become obstacles to continued development. That's the most confusing aspect of the competency trap. So, how do you break free from the competency trap? You need to make efforts in these four areas. First, you need to give yourself some blank time. Be cautious not to fill your schedule with daily trivialities, including valueless meetings. Also, provide strategic guidance to subordinates instead of doing their job for them. If possible, find someone to be your deputy or delegate management responsibilities to a few key employees to share the burden. This way, you have a chance to break free from the vicious cycle of the competency trap. Otherwise, you might end up like Jacob, forever caught in a firefight situation, led by your subordinates and various urgent matters. In summary, if you want to become an excellent leader, creating time for yourself is the foundation of everything. What should you do with the freed up time? Sit quietly in your office and contemplate. No, that won't get you on your hero's journey. You should use the time to become a bridge leader. As a contrast, you can think of Jacob as a hub leader. He chose to have the entire department revolve around him, seemingly the only way to demonstrate his value. However, this also made him unable to move away, the moment he left, the wheel would grind to a halt. Excellent leaders, on the other hand, are bridges. On one side of the bridge, you have your department and your team, and on the other side is the external world. What does the bridge do? You must ensure that your team gets the latest information and receive support in terms of resources. Additionally, when your employees do valuable work, you should seek opportunities to talk about their contributions to the outside world. This will motivate them further. When facing criticism, you should make an effort to gain recognition from higher-ups for your team's practices. Of course, you should also pay attention to what your competitors are doing and draw inspiration from their practices. In fact, these external communications are far more valuable than dealing with day-to-day -day trivial matters. In addition to being a bridge for external communication, your unique value as a leader can also be reflected in your foresight. Regular employees may only complain about the issues in their work, which is something almost anyone can do. However, an excellent leader should have the ability to look into the future and present well thought out, systematic, and forward thinking ideas, well, the meaning of the word leadership is essentially to have a vision that allows you to see what others can't, so that you can guide people forward like a navigator. In this context, having a vision for the future is not just wishful thinking, and it can't be achieved by simply sitting in an office with a crystal ball. Your inspiration needs to come from reality and be based on your keen awareness of your surroundings. For this, you must go out and absorb fresh information, including the industry's broader context, new technologies, emerging trends, and so on. Beyond your own industry, you should participate in interdisciplinary activities, engage in projects outside your area of expertise, see what people outside are doing, thinking, and what worldviews they hold. You need to expose your mind to these previously unknown elements, which can help you see more possibilities. Furthermore, you should be able to connect seemingly unrelated pieces of information and integrate them into a complete puzzle, continuously refining and adding to it. With this puzzle in hand, you will be better equipped to discover opportunities and threats that others can't see. In this fast-paced era, this ability is extremely valuable. Once you have developed forward-thinking ideas, the next step is to drive change and make those ideas a reality within the organization. This requires a certain level of change management skills. Many people might believe that a good idea can conquer all and naturally gain people's approval. However, the reality often involves some people staunchly opposing you and criticizing you, while the majority remains observant and neutral. You need to respond appropriately to the criticisms of opponents to convince people to understand and support you. For more guidance on how to win support in times of change, would recommend combining this book with another one, Influence. This book provides the best insights into change communication. Additionally, don't expect to make a big splash with a single move. You should aim to achieve small successes quickly to build people's confidence. People are more willing to support someone who is winning. 
Finally, you should promote your ideas widely within the organization and establish long-term management mechanisms. As you can see, breaking free from the competency trap, creating time for yourself, connecting to the outside world as much as possible, looking to the future, and ultimately driving change are what an excellent leader should do in their work. At this point, you have passed the first challenge, completing the transformation in your job content. However, in the hero's journey story, the main character always needs to find mentors and companions who can help from various angles, provide ideas, and contribute efforts. Next, in the second part, we need to address how to find this group of people to assist you in moving forward. Before finding these people, you need to face a new challenge called the relationship trap. Many people have a reluctance to building relationships, feeling that deliberately cultivating relationships is insincere and uninteresting. Those who fall into this trap tend to resist investing sufficient energy into their interpersonal relationships. Not to say they do nothing, but they usually go with the flow and deal with whoever comes their way. This approach is too passive and can result in a network of relationships that is often dysfunctional and structurally imbalanced. This imbalance manifests in two symptoms. First is narcissism. We tend to prefer befriending those who are highly similar to us in some respects. If they don't fit that mold, they often go unnoticed by us. Secondly is laziness. We prefer to connect with people who are physically close to us, those we naturally intersect with in our daily work. Such relationships require less effort and naturally develop. For instance, as mentioned earlier, Jacob's main relationships are with those within the food factory, and he barely interacts with the suppliers of raw materials for production since another department handles procurement. This kind of relationship network, characterized by narcissism and laziness, is inherently limited. Because everyone in your network is not significantly different from you in terms of abilities, resources, or viewpoints, you can't gain fresh, complementary input from it. As a result, such a relationship network can be likened to a pigeonhole that constrains your leadership performance and weakens people's confidence in following you. You must understand that expanding your relationship network is an integral part of your work. Devote sufficient energy to building a high-quality relationship network, it's your responsibility as a leader. So, how can you expand your network of relationships and make it more vibrant? This book offers three feasible directions. First, you can expand new relationships through existing ones. You've probably heard of the famous six degrees of separation theory, which suggests that you can connect with anyone in the world through a chain of up to six people. While it might seem like a fun theory, have you ever considered if it can substantively benefit your relationship network? Certainly, connecting with someone through six degrees of separation is quite challenging. However, building relationships with people connected through two degrees of separation is much more feasible, right? This means you can try to befriend friends of your friends and make them part of your immediate network. And if you can establish additional new relationships through friends of friends, going through three degrees of separation, you're well on your way to becoming a relationship building expert. The book provides an example of a Silicon Valley investor named Heidi Roizen, who regularly hosts something called an Italian dinner at her home. She has one rule for this dinner, invited guests cannot come alone, they must bring a few friends along. This way, everyone can introduce new connections to others. Her Italian dinners have grown to become the most famous social gatherings in Silicon Valley. Second, if you have the opportunity to attend events, don't confine yourself to a corner. Try to secure a speaking slot at the event or host a portion of it, such as a small panel discussion. In any case, seize the opportunity to showcase yourself so that more people get to know you and are willing to build a relationship with you. The rewards you gain from attending an event as an active participant far exceed those of being a passive observer. The book mentions Sheryl Sandberg, who is particularly skilled at expanding her influence through public speaking and writing. Most people know her not because she is the chief operating officer of Facebook, but because she voices her opinions in public forums. Third, you can establish your own social platform, such as having a social media account or leading the creation of a social circle. As mentioned earlier, the person who benefited the most from the Italian dinner was undoubtedly its host, Heidi Roizen. Almost everyone present at the dinner would consciously establish a connection with the host, which allowed her to effortlessly expand her relationship network. Her performance in this aspect is truly outstanding and even earned her a place in the Harvard Business School case collection. In Heidi, we see the emphasis that an excellent leader places on their relationship network. 
The second part of the book discusses how you need to advance through the second challenge of this hero's journey, breaking free from the interpersonal relationship trap, expanding a diverse and extensive relationship network, and undergoing another transformation. By the time you reach this stage in your journey, you will have experienced many things, and your outward performance will become more convincing, increasingly resembling a true leader. These experiences will stimulate a lot of what we commonly call reflection. Next, in the third part, let's talk about the step of reflection. Is there a difference between reflecting at this stage and initially pondering in your office? The difference is significant. By now, you've already taken action in the first two parts, so the reflection in this step is no longer uncharted territory, nor is it just theoretical. This is why we emphasize the shift from external to internal. Just like the plot in a hero's journey story, when the protagonist reaches a critical point, there will always be inner conflict and struggles. You will begin to reconsider a question, who am I? What kind of leader do I want to become? At this point, you need to be wary of the authenticity trap. What is the authenticity trap? It means that we insist a fixed label represents our true self. As long as you deviate from this label, you think you're not being yourself and start negating other possibilities. The author of this book, Ibarra, experienced the authenticity trap when he first came to Harvard to teach MBA classes. Like many novices, he was used to standing seriously on the podium and delivering dry knowledge to the students. The problem was that Harvard students had seen it all. They were accustomed to the classes of experienced professors and found Ibarra's teaching style dry and unengaging. Nobody liked to listen to him. Ibarra felt discouraged and went to observe how the experienced old professors conducted their classes. To his surprise, these popular professors were extremely relaxed, practically turning their classes into stand-up comedy stages. They told jokes and engaged with students energetically. In comparison, young Ibarra appeared reserved and old-fashioned. After watching the professors' performances, Ibarra found their teaching style too incredible and unconventional, something he couldn't accept. He believed he had to stick to his original style because that was the Ibarra he should be. However, as time passed, student evaluations of his teaching kept getting worse, and he felt trapped. This forced him to make a decision and escape from this trap. He decided to try something new. He began to learn from the experienced professors, telling jokes, leaving the podium to interact with students, and even eating the food students brought to class. After a while, Ibarra's approach became natural and significantly improved the class's effectiveness, completely changing student evaluations. The teaching style that initially seemed silly, exaggerated, and theatrical no longer appeared annoying. Eventually, he found himself enjoying teaching and the attention and applause from the students. Now, consider the two completely different teaching styles, which one represents the real Ibarra, and which one is a false self. In reality, it doesn't matter as long as he accepts himself. After all, what his true self looks like is determined by him. For a leader, challenges regarding self-identity are also encountered. For example, a newly promoted manager may want to maintain the friendly image they had before the promotion. This allows them to keep a close relationship with their current subordinates, who were their peers in the past. When instructing others, they may feel a sense of guilt, thinking they are abusing their power to exploit others. Some individuals resist spending time writing emotionally impactful reports or delivering passionate speeches in public because they find these actions insincere, and it doesn't align with their authenticity. But from another perspective, they are failing to fulfill their leadership duties because they insist on authenticity as an excuse to remain in their comfort zone. A an excellent leader must be willing to break the shackles they've bound themselves with, just as Ibarra did in the classroom, discarding these excuses and venturing in new directions to enrich themselves. This book provides several suggestions to help leaders expand their selves. The first is to change performance goals into learning goals. Many people are reluctant to change and expand themselves because they are overly concerned about the image they have in the eyes of others, fixated on self-imposed performance targets. For instance, they demand themselves to consistently exhibit qualities like humility and approachability, fearing that their years of good reputation will be tarnished in an instant. This is what we might call the idle baggage. When you focus all your attention on how you currently perform, you become afraid to make mistakes and reluctant to try new things. But what about the future? By setting your sights on what you can learn, you can replace performance goals with learning goals. Continuous learning leads to continuous change, which is an essential quality for a leader. 
The second suggestion is to become an excellent imitator. Find some leaders you are familiar with, preferably those around you. Observe them closely, identify the shining aspects in them, and use these as directions for expanding yourself. Don't feel ashamed about learning the art of leadership from people you've met or heard of. In fact, all leaders grow by imitation. For instance, Taylor Boardman, a partner at an American bank, could even detail which predecessors he imitated in leadership. He knew why he chose them and what each of them contributed to his personal development. So, boldly learn the art of leadership from people you've encountered or heard of, not imitating them verbatim, but rather gathering knowledge from multiple sources and making improvements, ultimately forming your own leadership philosophy. The third recommendation is to reshape your image using stories. You need to find your leadership story, your best practices in leadership. On one hand, you can use it as a means of communication to connect with others, and on the other hand, this story is shaping your self-awareness as a leader. However, the self-image reflected in the story also needs to keep up with the times. When you have a new goal, you may need to match it with a new story. For example, the Omnicom Group, a renowned advertising and creative company, had a former CEO named Charlotte who mentored a subordinate. This subordinate had an initial leadership story that revolved around the sacrifices they made for their family, highlighting their friendly, loyal, and dedicated qualities. However, this positioning didn't align with the image of a leader who could handle a crucial position. Charlotte helped the subordinate find a new leadership story. This story was about their adventurous travels around the world during their youth. They traveled for 18 months, enduring many risks and never giving up. This experience significantly shaped their tenacious character. This new leadership story helped the subordinate secure an opportunity to lead a large team. So, in the third part, what yourself is entirely depends on how you define it. You need to break free from the authenticity trap and dare to expand yourself in different directions. There are three related suggestions, including changing performance goals into learning goals, becoming an excellent imitator, and reshaping your image using stories that I in summary, the author of this book believes that the development of leadership should be an external to internal process. When you identify gaps and feel the urgency for change, you should take proactive steps to create new external expressions. Then, based on these external expressions, engage in reflection and internalize the choices and cognitions of a leader. External expressions consist of two aspects. First, redefine your work, break free from the competency trap, and invest your time in areas such as external connections, future outlook, and driving change, which can add more value to your work. Second, redefine your network of relationships, break free from the interpersonal relationship trap, and recognize that building relationships is an essential duty of a leader. Your network of relationships should be diverse and extensive. To achieve this, you can expand your network of relationships through existing connections, seize opportunities to showcase yourself, and create your personal platform for relationships. One aspect is how you do the work, and the other is how you conduct yourself in relationships. Demonstrating proficiency in these two areas makes you increasingly resemble a truly outstanding leader. The third aspect is the process of internalization, redefining your inner self. You need to break free from the authenticity trap and expand yourself in different directions. The key practice is to focus on long-term learning rather than short-term performance. Find leadership role models and use stories to reshape your image as a leader. At this point, your hero's journey completes a full cycle. When you enter the next phase, you will have a new goal. Regarding the hero's journey, if you want to learn more, you can find The Hero with a Thousand Faces in this book every day, it's also a very interesting book. Finally, a few thoughts. The three-step method presented in this book is not only applicable to the transformation into an excellent leader but also relevant to many other aspects of life. For example, if you plan to become a slash someone with multiple professional roles, you need to consider how to redefine your work and develop a network of relationships that will help you explore new horizons. Similarly, when you become a parent, and you want to be a responsible one, you must think about the role of parenthood. How do you balance your family and career? How will the addition of the parent-child relationship impact your network of relationships? Which relationships from the past should you let go of, and which ones have become more important due to your new role as a parent? Lastly, what outdated labels should you discard within yourself, and how should you expand yourself? In any context, this method encourages us to take action first and then reflect, continuously moving closer to our goals.
this covers the essence of this book. Congratulations, you've completed another book. Thank you for your support and attention. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom and practice to achieve our financial goals and create a better future. Thank you, and goodbye.